All right, let, let's uh, let's get started. Um, hi, my name is uh, Endu uh, Emuche. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. I'm an IBM Fellow Cloud Transformation and Engineering. Um, at IBM, I lead work um, with some of our largest clients, uh, really to help them reimagine the future to drive transformation at enterprise scale. Um, over the last um, eight months or so, I've been leading uh, work around uh, technology for good. We call it uh, tech for good uh, under the IBM Embrace initiative. Um, cloud computing, of course, uh, features uh, there and, and uh, as well as all the technologies that I'm sure we'll be speaking about. Emphasis today though, uh, would be around technology and the role technology can play uh, to really drive and accelerate racial justice. And then secondly, the importance of diversity in STEM to advance innovation and equality. Um, and then what I'll like to do um, is introduce uh, my panel. Um, uh, I think one of our panelists is having technical difficulty, uh, but we will get to the panel. They'll do a short introduction of the work they're leading in these two particular areas. And then I will make some opening remarks and then we'll get down to it. I will be having a really interactive session. We hope that um, if you had questions, ideas, thoughts, uh, you would be able to participate, um, ask questions in the chat feature. Um, also um, ask uh, questions in the Q&A feature and we'll attempt to answer those questions as time permits. So with that said, um, I would like to introduce uh, our esteemed uh, panelists, uh, Anisha Grant, um, who will introduce herself uh, Christina Saunders, and then if uh, Justin is able to join, he would also speak to the work he's doing. And then, of course, uh, Stephanie uh, Tina Misa, uh, who will speak to the work she's doing as well. So with that, I'll, I'll uh, take a quick pause and then just have Anisha uh, say a few words uh, about the work she's leading. Anisha? Thank you so much, Andu. Uh, so yes, my name is Anisha Grant. I am the Director of Education and Alumni Programs with Black Pearls Code. And the work that I'm doing specifically is to continue to support the young women who are coming from Black Girls Code, our programming typically tar targets young women from seven to 17. And my role in supporting our alumni is to oversee our young women who are 18 and older. So helping them find those pathways into STEM throughout college, and then also find uh, professional opportunities as they finish their undergraduate degrees and move into the corporate space. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, Thank you so much, Anisha. Uh, Christina? Hello everybody, uh, my name is Christina Saunders. I'm a human rights officer. I work with the United Nations Human Rights Office in Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, the role of the office very much at the moment um, is to fight for racial justice, uh, to eliminate racial discrimination, uh, xenophobia, and any form of related intolerance. Um, so I'll get into that a little bit during the discussion, but really honored to be part of this esteemed panel. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Christina. Justin? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I was having a few difficult, uh, difficulties, so my apologies there. Uh, my name is Justin Dawkins. I am one of three managing partners at Collab Capital, uh, where we're actively raising a $50 million investment fund to specifically invest in Black entrepreneurs. And we're also proud to present our um, our non-investment uh, non -investment organization, which is Collab Studio, which supports entrepreneurs and innovators um, in non-capital ways to ensure that they have access to the opportunities and they're prepared for those opportunities. Mm -hmm. So really, really excited about today's discussion and, and thank you to IBM for inviting me today. Thanks very much, uh, Justin. Look forward to the conversation. And then Stephanie, uh, last uh, but not the least, Stephanie. Hi everyone, my name is Stephanie Thanamesa. I'm a Code with Classy scholar, and currently I'm a freshman at Stanford University intending to study computer science. And a lot of my work has to do with um, trying to create a more diverse and inclusive STEM. So I've done lots of work in my community um, in California, and currently I'm doing uh, research on CS education in California. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. Um, thank you very much, uh, the panelists. Um, to uh, get started, let me say a few words just to set uh, context. Um, I'm going to be introducing um, some more information about the announcement we made yesterday as part of this um, important conference. Uh, it, it's around call for code for racial justice. 
Uh, to begin, we declare that Black Lives Matter, period. Uh, and then given all the events in the US, um, IBMers um, from all walks of life, especially Black IBMers and their allies, uh, really got together um, in their despair, in their frustration, in their exhaustion. Uh, at a moment of clarity, um, we really decided to apply all of the leading technologies and um, applying our ingenuity, our hopes, our aspirations to address the problem of systemic racism, uh, really to just uh, to drive sustained and enduring change. In order to do this, um, we actually, over the past um, number of months at IBM had an internal initiative called Embrace, Embrace uh, call for code challenge. We had over 500 IBMers who are passionate uh, visionaries around the world uh, really bring their talent, uh, the, the passion, the design, the creativity that that brought uh, really to drive systemic change um, within uh, the solutions that we announced yesterday. I'll be going in, into a bit more detail on what those solutions are, but they are in three broad areas, police and judicial reform and accountability, diverse representation, and then thirdly, policy and legislation reform. What we're doing uh, as part of uh, All Things Open is that we are uh, contributing uh, these solutions uh, to the world, uh, really to you developers. Uh, we invite you uh, to participate. Um, the Call for Code is a really a successful platform, program platform that allows us address some of the most pressing, intractable, unprecedented, uh, interconnected challenges of our time, including COVID-19, for example, climate change, uh, natural disasters. Um, we have um, as many as 400,000 developers around the world uh, in about 180 nations who participate um, fully with their passion and ingenuity in trying to, uh, trying to really solve these very important topics. We invite you, uh, developers, uh, those who are attending this call, we invite you to join with us, join with our partners um, who are driving a real change. Uh, we know you're already doing your part, but our goal is really to accelerate um, the change, um, to really address and go to the core of systemic racism as part of this initiative. We want to make sure that we do this in an aspirational way. We want to make sure that we are able to be authentic about this. We want to make sure that the change is both local in your communities as well as global as, as needed. Because Call for Code uh, for Racial Justice is not a finite um, definition of solutions or even a final definition of challenges, we will be providing new solutions in the future with your help. The goal for us is to drive adoption, to drive innovation, to combat systemic racism wherever ex it exists around the world. At the core of Call for Code, what this really is, is about empowerment of individual developers yourselves, about innovators, about social justice advocates like yourselves. We want to drive sustained impact at a global scale. And that's really the point of uh, this conversation we're going to be having with our esteemed uh, panelists. Now, as developers, uh, you actually are able to make a stand. You're able to answer the call uh, for code. You're able to really dive in and see what this begins to look like. You're able to make a commitment to adopt some of these technologies that we speak about today. What I'll do uh, briefly um, is actually uh, share my screen with you just so you see what this begins to look like. I'm going to show you uh, the real capability uh, that we're donating uh, to the rest of the world, um, to yourselves, in order to actually drive the kind of change that we speak, that we speak about. Give me one second to just share my screen so you see what this begins to look like. All right, so uh, you can see my screen right now. And what I'll do is ask some of my colleagues at IBM to drop the links in the Zoom chart as well. So what I'm showing you here is part of the announcement we made. You will have access to the links. And then I'll take you to uh, the actual projects. Um, and these projects are these ones that you see here. And you'll see, um, you know, open sentencing, for example, is one that begins to drive uh, visibility, transparency around uh, sentencing. Um, I will show you what that begins to look like in terms of the Git repository. 
So you actually see a fully fledged uh, solution starter set um, with all the resources that one might need and all the documentation uh, to help scaffold uh, the basic ideas. And developers right now, you on the call can jump in and actually begin to participate uh, in an open way to really drive the power of open around these solutions. The next one I'm gonna show you is around incident accuracy reporting system. Again, this is the Git repo. Uh, we're going to drop the links um, in the Zoom chart so you can actually have direct access to them. I show you this um, really to kind of indicate uh, that these are real solution building blocks, if you like, uh, they're not fully fledged. Uh, but the whole idea uh, for Open is that with your ingenuity, with your passion, um, with your drive, um, we together can make a significant change in how um, social change occurs. Here's another one. Uh, I won't go into all of the detail, but you will see five solution starter, starter kits um, really laid out um, and then with uh, detail on exactly how you might participate. So I'm gonna to want to thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen here. And then we'll go back to, we'll go back to the panelists. Uh, what I'm interested in, in knowing uh, from the panelists is, you know, how have we um, within the work you've done uh, in the companies that you lead, how have we actually um, brought the spotlight to this moment to drive the change? And then how might we sustain uh, such change uh, going forward. I'm going to start with Anisha. And then before that, I'm going to actually congratulate Anisha Black Girls Code uh, for the regional award that you won yesterday. Um, this is awesome work and I congratulate you again. But Anisha, any thoughts on this moment, uh, how we capture the moment, how we ensure momentum and then how we make change happen uh, going forward? Sure, thank you. So thank you to you and IBM <laughs> for the for the regional award. We are definitely proud uh, of that work. Um, and as far as what we've done thus far in order to respond to the moment, I think Black Girls Code, we realized with code in the name that we had to be leaders around how we're providing virtual education for our students, right? How do we move from that in-person interactions that was really driving this, the foundation of our program to virtual? So I think we've had an opportunity to work to be leaders around uh, that, that virtual transition, one, in just responding to the pandemic reality um, of our lives, and then two, in responding to the racial moment um, that America seems to be in. I think we've really tried to work with partners. So we've had a lot of outreach from organizations, from companies to say, all right, we realize we need to do better. Um, we need to be more mindful of how we're recruiting Black women. We need to be sure that we're supporting Black women within this tech industry. And so I think the work we've done is, is trying to be really thoughtful about identifying those partners. We want to work with people who are not doing it for the, the media hit um, in the midst of, of you know, the moment. We want to identify partners who are invested in partnering with us over the long run, not just for this year, not for this quarter, but have an idea and have support that they want to implement for Black women in the coding space over the next few years, because it's going to take a long road of work to address the inequities that exist within the tech industry. Um, and even within STEM education. So we, we are not looking for partners who, who just want to dip in and dip out uh, of this commitment. And so I think identifying partners, vetting partners, and then creating some long-term strategies um, in partnership with those, with those partners. I feel like I can't say partners any more times. But, um, <laughs> but uh, so, and, and I think one way that we're really focusing on doing those extended uh, engagements is through internships. So having folks actually take on um, students and have them brought into their company, teaching them, leading them, and hopefully creating new leaders for their companies, and then also through mentoring. So we work with a lot of companies. There's a lot of interest, thankfully, uh, with folks who want to partner with our students directly, um, share some guidance, and then we know that mentoring can happen not just on a adult to student, but adult to adult um, situation. And so figuring out how we can also collaborate with our partners to identify mentoring on the professional landscape as well, to keep that again, extended engagement over time. That is fantastic. So, so same uh, question to Justin. Justin, what are your thoughts? Justin, can you hear us? Ah, sounds like Justin might have technical difficulty again. 
Let's go to uh, Christina then. Uh, Christina, any thoughts on this particular uh, topic of uh, really understanding the moment and then driving momentum going forward? Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, I think it's a really critically important moment and, and we welcome this great initiative um, of IBM. Uh, I, I feel that there is um, a renewed uh, passion, uh, uh, a new movement, which is now a global protest of, of people standing up and saying, you know, we must fight racism, but we have to really grab hold of this moment and, and make sure that it, there is a continued effort, that it isn't just a moment, but that it is really a movement and that it continues until we achieve um, the goal of real equality, um, which is what we're fighting for. Uh, and in this context, the UN, and particularly the Human Rights Office, uh, where I work, we, we've been working for nearly 20 years since the World Conference Against Racism, which was held in Durban, South Africa. And that provided a lot of political commitments from different governments um, on what they said they were going to do to improve the world, to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, religious intolerance. And, and I think now, as we're coming to the 20th anniversary of the World Conference Against Racism, I think it's a really good moment to look at it again and to see how far we've come. And, and, and what you find is that a lot of the, the measures which were recommended and agreed upon by member states at that time are still extremely relevant today. Um, so we have a lot of work to do in terms of implementation. We also have international human rights law, uh, which provides a really robust framework for addressing systemic racism. Um, so we just need to get the support. Um, and I think already there is a movement uh, that's happening globally. Uh, so we need to make sure that it actually results in real change. Uh, and, and, real, uh, and I think through the work of everyone on this call, um, it's, how, it's how we can actually get there. Um, you know, through everyone's uh, initiative at every single level um, throughout the work that they do to make sure that the message goes out loud and clear that we, we really must uh, now turn to implementation, ensuring that the human rights for everybody is, is really protected um, and use these instruments that we have, use the international human rights law framework, uh, which puts an emphasis on the victims, um, making sure that they're at the center of everything that we do, and, uh, and holding perpetrators accountable in order to really achieve justice once and for all. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Christian. I, I think um, just working shoulder to shoulder, understanding that we've got to get to implementation, um, knowing uh, that uh, the long game is what this is all about uh, while we drive uh, the immediate steps in, in the moment. I think those are, are really critical points. Uh, St Stephanie, any additional thoughts on this question? And then we'll get into the, the STEM question, which Anisha indicated as well. Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, I found it super insightful for Christina to mention that there needs to be work on multiple levels, yes. right? So all across the spectrum, ranging from, you know, youth to all the way up into adults. And I think that um, Code with Classy in particular is doing a really well job in, in incorporating more girls, um, specifically more people of color into these fields and um, giving them a warm and welcoming introduction to these types of fields that are now dominated and lack a lot of diversity. Um, and so the importance of that is uh, we, are, we are starting to create a community of girls, of uh, people of color who have intentions of using computer science for social good or to work on certain issues that tackle, you know, racism in our country, for example. And this is all important because I really believe in the power of the youth, um, you know, the power in the new generation to create change. Um, it's really in our hands to move forward, to move, to transition in a world that actively wants to become anti-racist. Um, and I think this is incredibly important, especially taking into account that we need to reach um, to our youth. 
and make sure that they're included in these conversations. So I just wanted to add that, you know, one way that COVID diplomacy is trying to keep momentum within their small community is by creating a platform. Um, so alumni can come back and feel a support, net, like have a support um, and a, no, a network of people that they can, um, you know, lean on in order to create change in whatever way they wish, um, at whatever level they, they're able to do so. That's excellent, uh, Stephanie. Um, Justin, uh, do you have your uh, tech uh, issues resolved now? I do, I do. Fantastic. Right. So, so Justin, I'll do this, right? So you'll take that question and then as well as that question, perhaps you can broach the subject. Um, why hasn't this worked so far? Um, if uh, this were easy, I'm sure uh, we will not be having this conversation, but what are the thoughts about some of the constraints or some of, um, you know, some of the um, issues that have come in the way of this becoming uh, just uh, business as usual. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to actually answer kind of both questions in once. Um, so I think, because I missed, I apologize, I missed the panel, some of the uh, responses from the panel. Um, our computer decided to restart. Um, <laughs> love, hate relationship with technology, right? So um, mm -hmm. the, I think the, the first thing is greater intentionality. And, and I think, Anisha, you pointed this out perfectly, which is it has to be a multi-year strategic approach to uh, getting people and organizations engaged um, and doing it in a very intentional way. So building it into the strategy, not as a bolt-on, not as something that, that is purely just added on for, um, for the, the sake of doing the, the work in that way, but more like understanding that it's imperative to the, the, the strategic growth of the company. If you want to be a 100-plus year company, a 200-plus year company, uh, these are things that you're going to have to address at some point and it, there's no time like the present right and so i think that's the the, the first thing is greater intentionality um that's what we've really focused our efforts on and our energy on at, at, at collab and some of the organizations that i've founded in the past is high intention so i think that's the, the first part um why i think it hasn't worked thus far is because um for two core reasons one uh, the lack of intentionality i think um, it is a big part, you know, when things become, you know, I think what COVID did is it illuminated, it, it gave us, the world kind of slowed down just enough for us to shine a spotlight, a brighter spotlight on something that has been uh, plagued, that's plagued this country for honestly centuries. Um, and so that's the first thing. Uh, but I also think that the goalposts sometimes moved. Um, and I think that we, uh, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but I think that when we talk about access and we talk about skills, you know, it, we have to understand that this is a system where uh, whenever there's an opportunity, um, people of diverse backgrounds, people of color, women, they, all, they will always actively do the things necessary to, to, to earn their way um, at, to have a spot at those tables. But then the rules of the room change again, just as we, as we get to um, a place where there might be some equitability and some parity. So I think that why these things haven't worked is because uh, you know, once upon a time, it was, you know, you needed to have a high school diploma to get a job, then it was a degree to get a job. And now it's, you have to have seven years experience, maybe in a technology that's only five years old, like we've seen these things happen before. You're like, well, how does one get a job if you have to have seven years experience in, you know, something with only that's only been an active technology before five years. So there's there's this um, laddering and where the, the ladder continues to adjust and move um, within the rooms. And then therefore those that are trying to get access to those rooms um, are at a disadvantage before they even can kind of peek in the door. So I think we have to be mindful of our biases. I think we have to be mindful of the, uh, the moving of the goalposts, where, you know, wherever it may be, but understand it is a layered um, thing that uh, must be addressed at every single level if you want to truly have the impact that we all, that we all seek. Thank you very much, Justin. Very, very insightful indeed. And Anisha, I want to go back to you. I think you touched on STEM. I'm going to borrow from what uh, Justin uh, just clearly laid out, which is, you know, despite all of the effort um, in increasing pipeline and sort of all the investment and so forth, we still find that um, there is lack of representation, especially in STEM within the pipeline and even within the workplace. What are the um, what are the issues around that from your perspective, Anisha? And then we'll come back to uh, the rest of the panel uh, for their perspective as well. Sure. I mean, as as Justin was talking, I had a thought, and so technologists don't hate me, but I wonder if 
Uh, the patience required for systemic change is just antithetical sometimes to the speed at which things must change within technology, right? So I think I think about developers, I think about engineers, they, they go and they see a problem, they under, they create a plan to, to do it and they enact that plan within, you know, months of, of, you know, conception to execution potentially. And so the changes that we're talking about diversifying um, an entire industry just based on gender, right? Before we even get into race and ethnicity, um, I think the industry just has a lot of work to do on that front. So it's gonna take long-term strategic plans from companies and from hiring folks and from the industry in and of itself. This is not something we're gonna turn around um, in the matter of a year, in the matter of five years even. Uh, you know, for Black Girls Code, we, you know, our goal is 2040. So we, you know, when we started, we made this understanding that, um, we are going to be able to impact a million girls in 2040, which is, and then where do those girls go from 2040? Where does the industry stand um, at that point? So I think that's the first one is that I think the industry needs to have a little bit more patience and then also be creating these longer term plans. And I, and I also wonder how much thought um, the industry has given as far as like how far back you start that pipeline. Um, you know, I think it's easier to partner with colleges, right? When that's the space where you're recruiting, but college is too late. Yeah. Um, to begin to think about diversity. College is too late to begin to think about learning fundamental coding skills. And, and even as, as there are some institutions, some organizations that are willing to take kids right out of high school, we're finding that high school is also a little too late for teaching and building these foundations. And so I think we really need to support and work with companies who are willing to think about a 20 year strategy um, and, and go backwards in time to say, how do we connect with the middle school? How do we connect with elementary schools? Um, because companies are going to be building their current workforces today, um, you know, by, by looking at seven-year-olds. And, and as the industry has grown, we have jobs today that we couldn't fathom and imagine 35 years ago. Um, I think we do need some support and connection within the industry to be thinking about what are the jobs that we don't, we can't even fathom 35 years out and how do we begin to build a workforce that can sustain and support that. So I think it, it goes to the pipeline issue of how do we reach kids earlier and earlier, expose them, teach them, get them the knowledge that they need so that they can penetrate the industry. Um, and then how do we also, you know, as we're doing that to help certain groups of kids catch up continue to be innovative and continue to teach new technologies as they come out to the growing population to speak to, I think, Justin's point um, earlier around, you know, by the time you get into the room, the technology in that room is now dated. Yeah, um, so yeah. Now you're trying to catch up and, and, and learn whatever new things out there. So we have to figure out how to make those resources available to those un, uh, marginalized and underrepresented communities as well. That's, that's very well, very well said, very well said. So, so Christina, let me uh, come back to you. You talked about frameworks and you talked about um, ways of leveraging the tools that are available uh, to us. I wonder how would you um, answer the question that those frameworks might actually be uh, too rigid um, given the dynamicity of the environment, given the changes, the evolution of technology, given what Anisha rightly pointed out and Justin too, that things are moving so quickly, kind of feels like the goalpost is shifting and changing and the, the ground upon which we stand is sort of evolving as we speak, right? At times, it's just the nature of the framework itself because the framework was set, you know, 10 years ago, it wasn't uh, quite designed to be flexible. How do you speak to that just in terms of the STEM question and then the flexibility needed to adapt quickly and make sure that we're recruiting, we're building, we're going back and pulling you know, forward, right, um, into the future and, and making sure that we're ready uh, for the future workforce. Yeah, so, I mean, I think that um, what the other speakers have spoken about a lot is representation and uh, trying to combat barriers, uh, racial bias within the system. And I think that's, that's a field which uh, is, is extremely important. We need to address racial stereotypes and stereotyping wherever they exist because they do create real barriers and disparities. Um, so it's something which we're trying to address within the UN, uh, but of course we need partnerships. We need to be working with, with all those who, who care about this issue to get rid of racial stereotyping and stereotypes and to ensure that there is diversity and there is true representation of all communities because we've, we've seen through our work that this makes a massive difference. If you have a diverse workforce, if you have true representation, then they're able to articulate the, the concerns of different communities, they're able to address the concerns in a, in a much more um, accurate way. 
so it, it's extremely important. Um, in, in terms of you know whether the frameworks are, are outdated, um, I feel that they're not. I feel that even 20 years ago, when uh, people were looking at the problems of racism, they said that this issue is rooted in um, a legacy of colonialism and the uh, trade in enslaved Africans, which has left with us um, a legacy of racial injustice, uh, which needs to be undone. So I think we still, as a, as a world community, have not managed to implement and to address those root causes of systemic racism, which we see today. And I think what I find really exciting is that right now, everyone is talking about it. Everyone is saying we must um, rise up. We must uh, address racial injustice. We want justice. And in order to address systemic racism um, from the UN human rights point of view is you have to address the root causes. Where does it come from? And until we are able to have a truthful, um, honest conversation about the past, it's very hard to undo the current manifestations of, of racism. Um, so at the moment, the UN um, has a, a special team looking at uh, how we can address these root causes, but also how we can address the modern manifestations of the peace violence, um, the impunity for, for uh, law enforcement violations. Um, as well as violence against protesters that we're seeing in the US, but not only, you know, it's a, it's a global problem. Um, so, so these are issues at the moment. Um, I think the UN is trying to address head on. There was a special urgent debate at the United Nations Human Rights Council in June of this year, which created the team who are preparing a report um, on this, which will have recommendations to try and address the problem. Excellent, excellent. Um, I, I thank you very much, uh, uh, Christina, for all the work you're doing, all the work uh, UN Human Rights is doing. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. Uh, Stephanie, um, just given uh, Christina's um, perspective on this, could you tie the STEM question uh, to, you know, how do we hire for uh, skill uh, versus degree, uh, for example? How do we uh, provide the enabling environment for those who are inquisitive, who want to help, they have the talent, they have a passion. Uh, they're looking for that platform uh, to actually participate and make change happen. Could you tie that to what Christina talked about in terms of the sort of systemic nature of uh, the problem and then what uh, we must do going forward uh, in terms of not uh, looking for those degrees all the time, but actually knowing that there is a more flexible um, sort of framework that we can work within. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think right now it's very interesting because a lot of the skills that um, arguably you could gain through your through pursuing a computer science degree, for example, you could also gain um, through learning some through learning the technical skills through a course online, or through an open source, for example, the, the you know the 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 one that is um, IBM is doing right now, right. It, that's a different means of gaining the same technical skills, but we're still able to attain the same uh, skills in order to work on issues that we're passionate about. And um, I really also resonate with um, the question that you're asking because in high school, I it was very difficult for me to get access to STEM and um, STEM opportunities and computer science and artificial intelligence opportunities. It was just so difficult to attain um, due to the things in, going on in my in my school, and so I had to go out of my way and um, go out of school in order to learn these technical skills. Um, so I was learning them through like a non traditional way, I would say. So I was doing summer programs like Code with Classy, for example, in the year 2016, and I did Stanford AI for All in 2017. Um, and I did other research uh, fellowships during high school that were not tied to my school. So um, it was a lot of my independent work that I gained that I, that I gained and acquire these skills. And I was able to use my technical skills in order to work on projects that I was passionate about um, and that, you know, resonated with me. Um, so it really goes to show that um, in today's day and age, there's so much that we are able to do. Uh, there's so much out there that we can do despite not being 
you know, despite not pursuing a, um, you know, computer science degree, for example. And I think that's very empowering for a lot of individuals who don't have the means, um, you know, to go to college and to pursue these uh, lucrative careers. Um, so I think that's really empowering for a lot of individuals to have programs like Black Girls Who Code that I think for many girls there, it's the first time that they're having access to these technical skills. And for them, that's life changing. That really empowers them to pursue STEM in higher education. And I think that's incredibly important um, now that we're even moving towards a world where everything is so much more accessible. And I think that's the beauty of the internet. It's so accessible. Um, you know, with the computer and Wi-Fi, you can do so much. And it's so, it's so incredibly important that, you know, these skills are being um, accessible to students, especially in elementary school and in middle school and high school. It's so crazy to think about, but now, you know, moving forward, really need the youth to be able to have access to these tools um, that will, you know, are the 21st century skills um, that we all need. That is that is excellent. Um, in, in the time we have left, and we don't have plenty of time, I wanted to get to this uh, topic of partnerships, uh, partnerships. So uh, for the call for code for racial justice solutions, and, and we found through the dialogue uh, that we, we have to engage and partner with the very organizations that we hope to influence and, and change and reform. Um, Christina, maybe I start with you and then we'll go to Anisha. What are your thoughts about partnerships, why they're important, and then how you actually engage institutions in a holistic way uh, to drive both near term as well as uh, enduring change over time? Christina? Well, um, partnerships are crucial, um, and, and we need to partner with all stakeholders, including um, in, with agencies, law enforcement agencies, with governments with uh, different national institutions, uh, civil society, uh, so all stakeholders we have to engage. Uh, and why it's important is if we really want to be successful, then we need everybody to be on board and to understand the importance of it. Um, we have international human rights law, the, the International Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, um, which is international law, so therefore it's an obligation for member states to take action. and through the different institutions, they should be taking action. So that's something that we work with them in terms of raising people's awareness on, on what should be done, the action that's required, and, uh, and providing technical cooperation, building capacity in, in areas where they perhaps don't have um, the, the, uh, um, the knowledge or understanding. Um, but also at the international level, there is constant reviews of uh, the implementation of different conventions and, and treaties. Um, there is monitoring, uh, human rights monitoring of, of what's happening in different states. And I, I would say that there are also, you know, some um, good practices which I think can inspire others. So we also try to document good practices where we find them. Um, there are databases on uh, legislation, policy, um, steps which have been taken in the right direction, which we can point to. As, um, as a way forward and to encourage others uh, to take action there. So uh, I think it is critically important. And uh, as I started talking about these reviews, we have a review of the commitments made at the World Conference Against Racism. There's also an international decade for people of African descent, which is a midterm review, which is looking at recognition, justice and development for people of African descent. And so I think these moments of review is, a, is an opportunity for partnerships to be strengthened, but also for us to, to really look at the successful steps that people have taken and to try and encourage others to do the same. That, that's excellent, Christina. Let, let's go to Anisha. Anisha, same question uh, to you. In terms of partnerships, um, partnering with organizations that um, we hope to reform going forward, and then the critical partnerships that will be needed in order to succeed. How do you how do you um, view this, and then how would you recommend we approach? Sure. So I think one just to speak to like why partnerships are necessary. Um, you know, with Black Girls Code, one of the things we feel like that makes us stand out compared to other organizations that are doing similar work is community. Right. We are very very focused on being local 
and um, making sure that we are teaching girls to code, but they are being led by folks who live near them, who are in their town. Um, and again, building those opportunities for, for, for community. And I think when it comes to broader partnerships, community is also important in acknowledging what you do well and what you don't do. In the same way that you build um, any other team, I think partners need to figure out what is our strength. Our strength is connecting with black girls, right? Our strength is not around um, mobile app development or all these other things. And so we have to figure out where the, where's the direction we wanna take the group of girls that we're able to work with and who are the partners who can help us execute that effectively. Um, so I think partnerships are critical when we, once we acknowledge this is our, this is my lane and here's, here are the other folks who I need to help me build this bridge, right? Um, and so when it comes to critical things I think uh, folks need to do when they are building partnerships is I've come to believe that there are four pillars to really enact the change that we're looking for. One is around exposure. So in this partnership, how is this opportunity allowing us to expose more people to coding? Um, how is this allowing us to broaden the pipeline towards the tech industry? Um, the second would be around access. Um, so how is this partnership, how is this collaboration helping us to provide new points of entry into our space, into the tech fields? Um, and then opportunity, once we've identified talent or, or people who are benefiting and structuring our organization, how are we fostering that talent? How are we creating opportunities for that talent to flourish? How are we pulling that talent into other projects. And then the last piece is around support. How does this partnership actually build support for that, um, you know, contingent, uh, that particular cohort of talented individuals? Are we making sure that they stay within the industry? Are we making sure that they have uh, the resources they need to bring other people into the industry? So I think if we, um, to the, the point that I think was said before, if we are being intentional about how we structure our partnerships and we are examining why this partnership exists and what we want from it and, you know, running it through that lens of access, of exposure, access, opportunity, and support that we can begin to build, like I said, those long-term relationships that will enable us uh, to really change the industry, make it more diverse, and make it a space that people of diverse backgrounds want, feel comfortable in, and want to lead and want to stay in. So that's my, my two cents. Thank you very much, Anisha. And, and Justin, uh, we, we are running uh, short on time here, but on this question of partnership, I think it's critically important um, as Anisha stated, to have intentionality um, around what partnership looks like and then what success actually looks like in, in a sustained fashion. Um, Justin, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, the work you're leading uh, seems like a, a, a fantastic example to speak about partnerships. Uh, any thoughts on how this might uh, be considered or regarded? Yeah, um, I, I, I love to use the example of, of Collab Capital um, even though it's a it's a a tool to be used as an investment, it, it's it actually goes well beyond just financial capital. Um, what we decided to do very early on was was take a look at the existing systems, which I think we all would agree is something you have to do, and figure out how to dismantle it if it needs dismantling. It's not about painting it over. We sometimes you have to actually break things apart and get down to the root cause. And so that's what we did with the capital markets. We we looked at all the instruments that were out there, the different tools that were used to invest in innovations and small businesses and, and high, you know, high growth value based tech startups. And we decided to build something new based off of what we saw. And what we realized in, in along with some additional data, which is where partnerships come into play uh, with the, the Kauffman Foundation um, and some others that are that have been looking at this, uh, looking at the data points uh, for quite some time, uh, the KPOR Center, um, we, we realized that there's this massive opportunity, right? So there's a, there's an inherent business opportunity um, for 83% of businesses uh, that don't fall into uh, one of the traditional financial capitalization models, which is venture capital and banking. And so what we decided to do was build something new. And then we also realized that we needed to bring the very companies and the people that work in these, um, work in these uh, businesses, we need to bring them to the table to make sure that there was access and opportunity on the business development side for companies, particularly those that are high growth, mid to high growth. So it's more than just uh, financial capital, it is activating and unlocking the social capital, which is even more important than, um, or equally as important as we, when we look at financial capital is you can, you can build a team, a very talented team with hundreds and hundreds of uh, talented folks, but if they don't have opportunities to business development, sales and growth, um, then those businesses become stagnant and they, and they suffer and, some, and sometimes die. So, it is incredibly important that when we think about partnership, we think about it in a comprehensive way and look 
further than the surface and really, really um, to the points made um, by the panel earlier is really attack the issues at the core and really build from there. This is fantastic, and and uh, you well said, uh, well said, Justin. I want to thank Anisha, Justin, Christina, and Stephanie. Um, unfortunately, we've we've run out of time. Uh, I am respectful of your time. I'm respectful of the audience's uh, time. Uh, what I would ask is that you know every one of us on this call uh, really take action. Um, that's I think the important thing for us. This conversation will carry on, I'm sure, online. Um, let's connect. Let's make sure that we move the ball forward. Um, I want to thank you very much indeed. I've learned so much. I hope uh, the audience has taken away valuable lessons from this very meaningful conversation. Uh, with that, um, I would like to, again, end this and thank you very much for making time. Uh, good to meet you all and uh, thank you and look forward to working closely with you. Absolutely. Same here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.